Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia. Sons of men and angels say, Alleluia. Raise your joys and triumphs high. Alleluia. Sing ye heavens, ye earth reply. Good evening. It's so great to have you as part of our online worship service. This is Easter Sunday. I realized something earlier this week. The occasion that calls us together actually started in a place very much like this one, albeit thousands of years ago in the ancient Near East, not in our modernized society. Nonetheless, the location was the same. The meaning and significance was the same. This definitely is a place of sadness, a place of homage, a place of respect, but it is not a place of finality. This location to those of us that are people of faith does not mean that it is over. If anything, it means that it's actually just beginning. I'd invite you to continue worship with us as we read some selected passages of scripture. Let's read it together. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die, ever. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. For we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that sin's dominion over the body may be abolished so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin, since a person who has died is freed from sin's claims. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him, because we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, no longer dies. Death no longer rules over him, for in that he died, he died to sin once for all. But in that he lives, he lives to God. So you too consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive in God, in Jesus Christ. For in him we live and move and exist. For in him we live, we move, and we exist. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we are grateful for this day. We're grateful for this Resurrection Sunday, this 
unbelievable occasion that calls us together. We recognize that all across the world at this moment in different time zones and different languages and different cultures, your people are lifting high your name because of this great reality that Jesus Christ lives today. So we celebrate and we adore you, Father. We pray that you would be exalted, that you'd be honored in all that we think, do, and say this day. We bless you. Amen, amen, and amen. In him we live, we move, and we have our being. Another way to say it, that in Christ alone I place my trust. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm from the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depth of peace, when fears are still and striding cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. Oh, 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 Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless pain, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on the cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ. I
Well, good morning. Welcome to Resurrection Sunday. Uh, I realize that most of you, you've never done this before. Those of us that are used to going to church, this is, that's where we would be on this day. But today, we're here. Uh, I've shared this story before with the church. Uh, they most likely, most will remember it. But back right after the 1917 revolution in uh, Russia, uh, the revolution was very atheistic, and that's, that's a vast understatement. And uh, one of the party executives that, had, uh, that was in charge of making sure one of the larger churches in Russia, in Moscow specifically, was going to fall in line, he showed up at the church and demanded that he take the time before the priest ever spoke to make sure that he told everybody what was really true about God. And so he got up, and for 45 minutes, he railed against all things God. He made sure that, that the communist propaganda was very clear. He made sure that everyone was absolutely clear that there was no God, that God was, was just a figment of the imagination. And as Lenin said, religion was nothing more than the opiate of the masses. And he finished and sat down. And the priest looked over at him and very slowly stood up and walked up to the front of the church. And in a loud, clear voice, he said, Christ is risen! And the whole church, in one thundering response, said, He is risen indeed. We don't really know what happened to the rest of the story. But we do know this. Jesus Christ is risen. He's alive and he's here for each person that seeks him today. It's been almost 2,000 years since Jesus Christ died on a cross. And it's been almost 2,000 years since he rose from the dead. And he's been in heaven during all that time. Sunday, April 12th in 2020 is Resurrection Sunday. Yeah, we live in a culture that has made the Christmas season about the colors red and green about a white-bearded guy in a red suit, and, and, and he turned that season in perhaps one of the largest buying seasons of the whole year. And this same culture has attempted to make Resurrection Sunday not about Jesus Christ, not about our risen Lord, but about bunnies and eggs, about soft pastel colors and flowers and new outfits and candy. Yet it isn't about any of those things. I've, I've heard many people rationalize these more modern symbols, you know, the Easter egg and, and the bunny and all of that. They're trying to, uh, they attempt to spiritualize it. And they talk, they say it, it, re, it reminds them of the newness of life and the new birth. All the while, they're glossing over the importance that society places on, on, on bunnies and eggs and chocolate and flowers. In John chapter 20, verses 1 to 18, we find the one major difference between Christianity and all other religions and belief systems in this world. And that difference is our God is alive. Our God died, rose, and lives forevermore. Someone that I have a, a great deal of respect for his intellectual savvy is a gentleman named Eric Erickson. And, and this past week in a post, he wrote this. He said, the cross should make you question everything. It should make you realize that there is a real truth, real accountability, and a real God in charge of all things with a real plan. See, in this passage in John, we see the incredible wisdom of God, which not only presents to us God's demonstration of his power over death, but it also is a presentation of, of God's understanding of our need. See, in order for humanity to, to gain understanding of, or, or the knowledge, the facts presented have to be relatable to us. They have to be relatable to our experience. The birth, life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ did not occur in a vacuum. It occurred before witnesses, in time, to people just like us who had relationships with Jesus. 
For us to be given the ability to grasp how these people reacted, we also have to be given the ability to understand the importance and the consequences of all that happened on Calvary's Hill almost 2,000 years ago and what happened at a grave nearby that same distance back. Follow along as we read how those who are employed in their faith in our passage today will react to their life and their world and their God. Let's read beginning in John chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the Scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. There's only two main points that I want us to see out of this exceptionally well-known passage. First, I want you to see that employed faith is observance. It's observant faith. It's a compliant faith. In verses 1 to 10, we see this. In these opening 10 verses, we see a set of events which, you know, from our perspective of having all the Bible and understanding all of this story, this is almost beyond our comprehension. We are told that Mary Magdalene, Peter, and John all initially came to the tomb, and they witnessed that it indeed was empty. Because we have read all of the story and we know all the events, there may exist, there may be a tendency for us to look at what they did and be very, very critical of them. Uh, see, these were people who lived with Jesus, who touched him, ate with him, and sat under his teaching. They were witnesses of his personality. They saw his facial expressions, his humor, and how he made each and every lesson from Scripture come alive. Yet when they arrived at the tomb early on the first day of the week in verse 1, they were clueless as to why the body of Jesus wasn't there. Yet for us to gain understanding, we only have to read what John wrote in verse 9. Because there John writes, For as yet they did not understand the Scripture that he must rise from the dead. 
See, John included this verse as an explanation as to why, when they first saw the empty tomb, they didn't believe. In James chapter 2, the Apostle James is presenting evidence of, of how faith looks. By what means do we recognize faith? And, and, and while the gift of faith, our ability to believe, to have a relationship with the Father through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, and for us to be able to live through the power of the Spirit, all of this ability comes from the faith granted to us by God, according to Paul in Ephesians 2. James says, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. In other words, if you say you believe, but there's no evidence you believe, your statement is meaningless. Your faith that you claim to have is dead. He closes that chapter making the parallel, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. In chapter 2, verse 26. Now, just as we are witnessing here in these opening 10 verses of John 20, it, it isn't the actions of Mary Magdalene, Peter, and John which determined whether or not they would be considered faithful. It was the evidence presented through their actions that gave us insight to what kind of faith they had. See, John describes clearly what they all deserve, observed. It, it was a tomb without the body of Jesus. It was burial clothes which wrapped the body, lying as if the body had, had literally like passed through the strips of clothing that they wrapped the body with. And then that cover that was over Jesus' face, uh, Peter observed that it had been folded and laid to the side. John records in verse 8 that the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. Please note what is said here. John did not write that Peter and Mary did not believe. John did not write that he was so much better than the other two because he did believe when he saw the empty tomb and the empty linen cloths. He didn't put that down. While belief was exercised by John, it wasn't a full belief. It was... For lack of a better term, it was compliant. It was there. It was attested to. But there wasn't any evidence of it. It was more intellectual. See, the reason Peter and Mary, and indeed the rest of the disciples, did not believe, was it, it was not because they did not have any faith. It was because they did not understand See, after John writes this verse that they did not understand, he records in verse 10 that they returned to their homes. Since they had been called by Christ to follow him, have you ever thought that this was the first time that they were struggling to understand anything, any event, any part of Scripture, any part of the promises that Jesus had told them about? This was the first time they had ever tried to do this without Jesus being present with them. There is no doubt they belong to Jesus. But see, unlike those of us today who have a relationship with God, we have the presence of the Holy Spirit within us. They did not yet. They would on Pentecost, but they didn't have it yet. Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. See, the Spirit of God enables us to understand the things of God. In chapter 2, verse 14 of that same chapter in 1 Corinthians, Paul writes, The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because why? Because they are spiritually discerned. This is why you can have two people in the room. One of them have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. The other one does not. They can both read the same verse. One of them will just get incredible meaning out of it, and the other one just thinks it's the most lucid, the ludicrous things I've ever heard. God has provided those of us today 
who have sat under the teaching of Jesus and who, you know, we, we, we've heard teachers, pastors, Sunday school teachers, other evangelists tell us what Jesus taught, but we didn't sit under Jesus himself, and we've not been able to see him, and we've not been able to walk with him, but we have been given the complete revelation of God through Jesus Christ, and it's in God's word, the Bible. And the only reason that we can understand it is because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. See, of course, we still need instruction in order to have more understanding. That's that's why we go to church. That's why you're watching this now. Yet even our desire to learn, it's not something that's natural for us. It's because of the indwelling presence of the Spirit of God. See, a compliant faith, it's a real faith, but it's not an obedient faith or obedience because obedience is shown through an accomplishing faith in verses 11 to 18. The Gospel of John is unlike any of the other Gospels. The other Gospels are referred to as the synoptic Gospels. Uh, The word S-Y-N, we have seen that before, that prefix, and words like synonym. Uh, Same word. Uh, And optic is where we get our word for sight. It is the Gospels which they record the same events, but from different sites, from different points of view. Uh, I remember when I was in seminary, uh, one of the professors said that Matthew was written to the Jews. It emphasizes the royal lineage of Christ. Uh, Mark was written to the Romans. Uh, I I think uh, Patrick Stewart, remember him from Star Trek? You know, engage. Um, Just a brief moment there. Uh, You know, he he actually did a whole show where he did, he read without, you know, reading. You know, he spoke the whole book of Mark. Mark is an action-oriented book. That was very much a description of the Roman culture. Luke, well, Luke, Luke wrote to the Greeks. The Greeks wanted to know. If you go into the, to the book of Acts and you see when Paul goes to Athens, they were always seeking to know something, to know a new thing. So Luke gives us a tremendous amount of detail. But then John. John has written in excellent Greek. It would appeal to a Greek audience, but more than anything, it would appeal to people everywhere because he deals with basic concepts of meaning. In the beginning was the word, the logos, the the base meaning of all things. We begin to notice the spiritual emphasis that God has placed throughout John's writing. Jesus stating that his words are spirit and they are life in John chapter 6 verse 63. John presenting Jesus as the door in chapter 10 verse 7. Jesus as the light of the world in chapter 8, verse 12. And he is the way, the truth, and the life in John 14, verse 6. And the reason John's gospel differs from the synoptic gospels is that God's plan and inspiration, John had a different purpose in telling the gospel story. He wanted people to see Jesus more than anything else and he wanted to understand for people to understand the spiritual necessity behind seeing and understanding Jesus. There's a lot of spiritual themes of light and darkness. We see that a lot, of, of knowing and not knowing. And uh, so you see these themes that are occurring throughout the book of John. One of the ongoing struggles in our culture today is that a man for equality among the sexes uh, unfortunately, our, our culture has become so confused that there's now a huge debate going on on what sex is, what is male and what is female. Uh, yet beginning in verse 11, God, through the inspiration of the Spirit, has led John to include how out of all of the disciples, Jesus chose to announce his resurrection not to a man, but to a woman. In verses 1 to 10, it demonstrated a compliant yet inactive faith, one which was possessed but not demonstrated. In verses 11 to 18, John describes the struggle that Mary Magdalene had while coming to grips 
with her expectations of events. I mean, she showed up to the tomb expecting to find a dead body. And Mary, in spite of her initial fears and emotion, she used her faith. And, and what we saw and what we see here in this passage is its faith accomplished. One of the first evidences of true faith, it, faith is, is the persevering nature of faith. Mary stayed at the tomb, standing outside of the entrance after Peter and John left. Now, like most men, the Bible only says that they went back to their homes, and we see really no real explanation given to Mary regarding what they saw or why they left or even that they were leaving. They just went right past Mary after she went and got them. Remember, she was, remember, she was the one that got them. And she brought them there, and they went in, and they looked at everything, and they stood around. They probably didn't say anything to each other. At least uh, John's gospel doesn't say that they said anything, had any conversation. And then they left. Uh, I guess it's kind of nice that certain things don't really change a lot, huh? But Mary did not simply just stand there and weep. But she also looked into the tomb. And I think this is important because I, I don't think we often understand the principles of Scripture, how they play out. In, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, Jesus tells his audience, Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. Mary was seeking answers. And more importantly, Mary was seeking Jesus. And God made sure that she found what she sought. Now, because Mary waited, she had the opportunity to interact with angels, even though she had no idea they were angels. Uh, dissatisfied with their answer, she turned around and she ran into Jesus, but there again, she didn't know it was Jesus either. But notice that Jesus just did not stand there and wait for her to talk. We serve a seeking God. We serve a God that gives and a God that sends. And here, Jesus saw Mary, and he spoke first. He asked her two questions. Why are you weeping, and whom are you seeking, in verse 15? She asked Jesus, thinking that he was the one who tended everything in the garden, where was Jesus, his body? Now, notice very clearly, while Mary was seeking Jesus, she was seeking his body, not his resurrected self. She was still expecting Jesus to be dead. Yet notice, Jesus responded with grace and mercy. Rather than chiding her for her error, Jesus just spoke her name, Mary, in verse 16. Do you remember when Jesus taught in chapter 10, verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me? See, Jesus here proves the truth of his teaching in speaking the name of Mary. She immediately, on hearing him say her name, realized that this was Jesus. Of course, much has been made of the specific title that Mary uses. Uh, you know, they go into great detail about the three different levels, the three different uh, account levels of accomplishment of rabbis. I, I don't think that's the most important thing we should see here, though. What is important is that she realizes that it was Jesus, and she also realizes that he was alive. The context gives us the understanding that she rushed and grabbed hold of Jesus in a manner that basically caused Jesus to tell her not to cling to him any longer, specifically like that. Now, it wasn't inappropriate. It wasn't anything other than a, a grateful, thankful, I don't want to ever lose you again type of hold. But it was a hold. She, the, the, the Greek there really communicates the fact. It wasn't just the fact that Jesus was chiding her for touching him. That is not the point. It's easy for us to, con to comprehend the confusion that probably was immediately overcame Mary. She thought someone had taken Jesus away. Now she found him. And so what would you do? Same thing that Mary tried to do. She did not want to let him go. Jesus' response in telling her to no longer take hold of him physically led him to be able to prepare her to understand that she should seek Jesus more than the physical, but spiritually. 
which at first is rather difficult for us to comprehend, just reading this verse in isolation from the rest of the New Testament. See, Jesus was not concerned with Mary rendering him unclean because he was about to go and present himself to the Father. Follow me here. Jesus was God. The Father, Son, Spirit had a perfect, continuous, unified community of relationship. Jesus did not have to go to another location or go to another uh, transcendent plane to the Father and the Spirit so that he could show them all that he accomplished. He was God. What he knew, they knew. What he experienced, they experienced. We cannot get sidetracked on this. Yet Jesus wanted Mary to understand their new relationship with God. Well, just like, I know what some of you might be thinking, well, how do you get that out of this verse? I mean, I don't see that at all. But look, Jesus, since his betrayal by Judas, was, he was in the process. Ever since Judas betrayed him, he was in the process of ascending to the Father. His destination at that point had changed. Oh, no, he still hadn't gone to the cross yet. But up to that point, Jesus was always heading toward Jerusalem, toward everything and all the events that would happen in Jerusalem. But once Judas started everything moving toward that event, then his focus changed more to the Father. He was on his way to the Father. Up until his betrayal, Jesus was heading to Jerusalem and his crucifixion. But now he was heading to the Father. The new relationship is explained when Jesus told Mary, But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God, in verse 17. Notice he didn't say, I am going to ascend. He says, I am ascending. That's a, you know, an ing verb. He's in the process of ascend. He is ascending to them, to the Father. No longer were they servants. No longer did Jesus refer to them as friends. But since he had paid the price for sin, they and everyone that believes, even today, we are all part of the family of Jesus Christ. It it blows my mind for, for me to realize that God loves me with the same love that he has for his son. And it's not because... I'm a good kid. It's because Christ was perfect. And he paid the price perfectly. And I'll notice what Mary did next. In verse 18, it says this. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Mary demonstrated a faith that was accomplished through her act of obedience. Now, some of us would have probably wanted to stay there. You know, not, not, we don't want to let Jesus out of our sight. We don't want to let him go. We wouldn't want to risk walking away and then trying to find him again and him not being there. Yet while we may find what Jesus said to Mary as somewhat confusing, it does make sense when she obeyed and left. Jesus told her, go. We don't see Mary struggling with this. We don't see her saying, Lord, I I just found you again. I thought you were gone. No, we don't see any of that. She obeyed. See, Mary employed her faith. She used it when she announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, in verse 18. See, today, because of all that God accomplished through the birth, the life, and the death, burial, and the resurrection of our Lord, all who are called, all who repent and turn from their sin and believe in Jesus Christ, calling on His name to be saved by Him, we will see Jesus again. So I haven't seen Him the first time. You see evidence of Jesus all around. Remember when Jesus told Nicodemus that you hear the wind, you see what the wind does, but you can't actually see the wind? When we see someone else praying for us, 
when we see ourselves realizing that this particular thing is wrong, when we find ourselves longing for Jesus to return, when we see the events going on in our world and it just makes us want heaven even more, we see Jesus. And in the future, we're going to see him again. The cross and the resurrection has changed everything. The question that I leave you as I close now is, has it changed you? Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would allow those that have heard your word, and heard me read this story, these 18 verses of the resurrection of your son. Father, that they would understand their need of him. Father, there's many people that hear this that already know you. You allow them to be encouraged, to be strengthened. Your word is living and powerful, and it's sharp as a two-edged sword, and it can cut through all of the noise and the fatigue and the problems and the hassle that we are facing in our world today. And Father, it will either give us succor and hope or it will make us guilty and realize our sin and cause us to change. Father, if there's someone out there that is in need of you, they have come to realize that they do not have a relationship with you. Father, you let them first understand that they must realize that they are sinning, that they are sinners. They cannot get to heaven on their own. Father, create within them that desire and cause them to want to repent, to literally turn 180 degrees from their sin, to stop doing what, they, what your spirit is showing them that is wrong, that they are doing, and allow them to call out for your name so that they will be saved. Father, we love you and we thank you for sending your son. Father, we ask that you would plant your word deeply within us and may we too see the evidence in our lives of an employed faith. We love you and we thank you. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. God bless. What?
Well, I can't believe it. Our time is almost gone, and we really thank you so much for yours. I want to leave you with just one closing thought, and it comes from John chapter 20, verse 18. It's Mary that's speaking, and she says, I have seen the Lord. She runs back to the ministry office, I guess that's where you call it, where all the disciples were hanging out, and she shares the exciting, very relevant news. She says to them, I have seen the Lord. As you look behind me, you can see that there's not a car in sight. I haven't seen a person in the past 10, 15 minutes. What would it mean if in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye, this parking lot was full of cars going this way and that way, and there were hundreds of people trying to get my spot? It would signal the end of the coronavirus, and it would mean the end of isolation. What did Mary see? What did it signal to her? I have seen the Lord. What was the significance of that statement as she brought it back to the people that had walked with Jesus for three years? I have seen the Lord. More importantly, what are you going to see in the next six hours? What are you, what are we going to see in the next six days? Will we see the manifestation of our own fear, doubt, and worry, or will we be able to look with the eyes of faith? Will we be able to see the Lord in each scenario, circumstance, and situation of our lives as they play out in our normal everyday events. Nothing big, nothing small, just everyday life. Can we say, I have seen the Lord? It's Resurrection Sunday. And for Mary and a very small handful of people a long, long time ago, everything changed because Mary could say, I have seen the Lord. The implication of Jesus being alive is far reaching, far reaching. It is a hope and prayer of our fellowship that it reaches you and has an impact on you where you live, where you work, and where you play. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now, henceforth, and forevermore. Amen, amen, and amen.